You know you've hit rock bottom when you seek refuge in a gas station bathroom to cry. This is what I realized as I stared at my puffy face in the grimy mirror of an out-of-order restroom in the middle of nowhere. The closest thing to luck I had enjoyed in a while was a conveniently unlocked door. The privacy was a relief, despite the disrepair the place had fallen into. A cloying, oily stink permeated the air, like mouldering flowers, combined with something unidentifiable but undoubtedly malevolent. It stung my bloodshot eyes and burned my sinuses. The place felt dirty, not just on a physical level, as if the filth penetrated your mind, coating your consciousness in the same layer of greasy filth that covered every inch of the vile den. I felt as if the foulness was seeping into the cracks of my broken heart. Corrupting my mind, body, and soul. I wondered if my husband had been right to cheat on me. If I wasn't good enough, or, or if I deserved to walk in on him in bed with his subordinate after returning home early. I blamed myself for his infidelity. I didn't know exactly when the love of my life had betrayed me for that blonde, but I knew that if he didn't love me, I had no reason to go on. We'd met in high school, and since then he had been my light. He was the reason I got up in the morning, the reason for my continued existence. I felt as if, as if, without him, I would simply cease to function. Ugh, you hideous, fat cow. I spat at the tarnished mirror. My reflection looked ruddy and distorted in the warped glass. I glared at it, gripped by hatred, unable to turn away. The creak of the heavy door broke my trance, and I whipped around. Before me stood a pale, bony, teenage girl. Her dark, open hair appeared to be going grey at the roots. She wore threadbare hiking clothes. She looked up at me through a curtain of hair. Her eyes looked as if they'd once been blue, but, like her hair, were descending into a pale silver grey. They appeared apologetic, as if she had wronged me in some way. Oh, sorry about this, she said, her voice diminutive and meek. Sorry for what? I asked, perplexed. There was something odd, almost eerie, about her voice. It sounded hollow and defeated, but beneath that, there was an air of desperation and hunger. I'm... I'm so very... so very... Oh, so very, very sorry, she whimpered. Tears were now flowing down her pale cheeks. I have to. What do you have to do, honey? I asked, my mothering instinct kicking in despite my own weakness. She seemed vulnerable and scared, nothing but a poor little girl lost in a big world. At least tell me what's wrong. Oh, you wouldn't believe me, she said matter-of-factly. It's just too strange for rational belief. At a mention of the strange, a chill ran down my spine. I was on Cranberry Island, Nova Scotia, the island on which the town of Cranberry Falls dwelt. Cranberry Falls were notorious for the ghost stories and folklore there, and many claimed to have witnessed bizarre and terrifying things on the awful island. I'll give you the benefit of the doubt, I said, Dread washing over me. There are a lot of strange things on this island. The girl laughed. A dry, raspy sound. <laughs> Lady, she said, smiling painfully. Oh, you have no idea. So, I said apprehensively. Do you want to talk about it? She narrowed her eyes. Sure, 
she said. Why not? I was visiting Cranberry Falls in order to debunk some of the urban myths that surround this place. She paused, letting out a bark of sarcastic laughter. <sighs> Shows you how much I know, eh? She chuckled under her breath before continuing. You know the dead spot? She asked, raising a grey eyebrow. It was clearly a rhetorical question. Everybody knew about the dead spot, and everyone avoided it. People who didn't avoid it came back different. So, anyways, she said, I was a tourist here, and I wanted to see if this dead spot was real. So I decided to investigate the area. People told me not to go, but... <laughs> Being the moron I was, I ignored their warnings and checked it out. I was enthralled, curious to know more about the mystery my hometown had held to its chest for so long. What was it like? I asked, trying to mask the curiosity that dripped from my every syllable. Her face darkened, her eyes glazing over as if she were in a trance. She spoke in a low, intense voice. It was a warm summer day, and the world was wonderful. I stood upon the grassy ridge overlooking that wretched stain on this earth, and I was curious. The old saying was wrong. Curiosity didn't kill me. It damned me to a fate worse than any death. She looked at me, her dead eyes brimming with tears. I walked right up to the edge of the circle. It was just a line. It stretched up to the clouds. There was a perfect circle of inky thunderheads in a perfectly blue sky directly above it. I crossed that line, and it was the worst mistake I've ever made. What happened? I asked in terror, turning my blood to ice and my voice dropping to a soft whisper. She stared me directly in the eye, her face twisted in a mask of grief and pain. I changed, she said. The second I stepped over the line of death, I knew I was trapped. I turned to see the more cadaverous grey trees, the dead forest stretched eternally behind me as if there had never been anything else. The air held a cloying, oily stench like death and lilac blossoms. There was no temperature, there was no wind to rattle through the dead boughs to carry that awful smell. She took a shaky breath. I don't know how I came to be the way I am, but I know that it happened. Once the sun set, I tried to break her frosty gaze, but I was physically unable to do it, as if my eyes were magnetically drawn to hers. My breathing came in shaky gasps as my lips formed the words independently of my free will. What are you? I whimpered softly. I what comes from that place, she said. The crimson light of the setting sun bathed the trees in a wash of red, the sunset tasting like blood, as if the light had a flavor. Shadows danced across my peripheries, inky shapes of a vermilion backdrop. They clawed at the corners of my vision, whispering and hissing with mocking laughter. I cried and cried, and they laughed and laughed. With every passing second, they drew larger and closer, and then darkness. She paused, inky tears pouring from her eyes. I am one of the things that haunt this place, the flesh-eating immortals who cannot die nor control their hunger. I I'm one of the monsters that dwell in Cranberry Falls. My blood turned to ice as pure fear gripped me. I'd feared these creatures since childhood, 
and now there was one standing a meter before me. A lump formed in my throat, threatening to suffocate me. I stared into her bleak grey irises, and I knew I would never be seen again. And that's when I realized that I was fine with that. I had nothing left to live for anyway, so why shouldn't I let her eat my flesh? Maybe I would be useful for once in my life. Oh, go ahead and kill me, I said flatly. I deserve to die. The girl looked taken aback. Why do you think that? She asked, a hint of genuine empathy hiding under her words. I have nothing left, I said, my voice catching and devolving into sobs. I fell to my knees on the filthy floor, a deluge of tears flowing from my eyes. The girl crouched down beside me, her face a mask of concern. Why? she asked. Because I'm unlovable, I sobbed. It's my fault my husband cheated on me. I couldn't even keep the love of my life from hating me. I'm worthless. <laughs> the girl stroked my hair. It isn't your fault, she said warmly. He is the one who cheated on you. My predicament is my fault. Yours isn't. But why? I cried. Why would he cheat if there was nothing wrong with me? Maybe because he's a scumbag? The girl said with a hint of sarcasm. Maybe because he doesn't appreciate you. You loved that man to death, and he stabbed you in the back. What did you do wrong? Hmm. She had a point. I could tell she was far wiser than I. Seriously, honey she said sarcastically. You're talking to me about mistakes. Last I checked, you aren't the one who literally damned herself to an eternity of cannibalism in under five minutes. <laughs> she laughed bitterly, and I managed to smile. Speaking of flesh-eating, would you like some help dealing with your hubby's mistress? A wicked sort of glee spread through me at the thought of that girl getting eaten by my new-found friend. Before I had a chance to think it through, I responded with a brisk, Yes. Now that his secretary is gone, my husband has realized the error in his ways and begged me to take him back. I rejected him, and now I'm enjoying life as a single lady. Or rather, I was. The strangest thing happened to me last night. I need some help, or advice, or something. Guys, I'm scared. I was walking home last night, as I always do. I remember it being abnormally cold for a spring evening. My breath rose from my lips, creating a dense mist in the biting winter night. The darkness ahead had the appearance of a solid wall. The dim yellow glow of the lone streetlight behind me was fading quickly as I traversed the desolate country road. The silence matched the darkness in its utter totality. The combined effect was oppressive, to say the least. It felt as if the air was being pressed from my lungs. I turned a corner stepping out of the light's protective halo. The air grew colder, as if any warmth had retreated with the light. My feet knew exactly where to go despite the dark. I had walked this road so many times that the way had been etched into my muscle memory. My mind wandered to a time before my family had abandoned our comfortable city life in favor of the small town of Cranberry Falls, Nova Scotia. The town, a place that was shrouded in myth, had its fair share of urban legends. From the ghost of a young girl called Cadence Valor, haunting the campground at the edge of town, 
to a supposed beast that stalked the woods after dark. Yes, this place was filled to the brim with superstitions and campfire tales. I had lived there for years, and never encountered any of the beasts that supposedly haunted the quaint maritime village, but I knew many people who claimed to have been haunted by one monstrosity or another. I knew that at least some of the stories were true, of course. I had recently encountered one of the legendary beings, and she had turned my life around. But still, the thought of such stories began to make me nervous. I tried to banish such fabrications from my mind, but they refused to go. A subdued dread began to gnaw at my mind feasting upon my sensibility like a pack of wolves devouring a fresh kill. I heard a twig snap, and, though I was sure it was but a product of my anxiety, I broke into a sprint. The faster I ran, the more my mind filled the silence with ghastly noises. Was that breathing? Did something just growl at me? These and many other related questions plagued my mind, as I accelerated down the desolate path. Suddenly, I recognized the cloying, oily smell from the bathroom, and I tensed up. Were there other beings like my friend? What if one of them was following me? I ran faster, knowing I would soon be in the relative safety of my house. The smell stayed faint, seemingly less strong than the stink of the girl but still there. My pulse quickened as I sprinted faster, anxiety and adrenaline turning my blood to fire as my legs pumped furiously. I tripped over something large, falling face first on the hard gravel road. My nose connected with the dirt and a hot, coppery fluid gushed down my face, filling my mouth and soaking into my shirt. I couldn't see what I'd stumbled over, so I crawled on my hands and knees, trying to identify the object in question. My numb fingers clawed at the ground, but my frantic search yielded nothing. As if the thing I'd tripped on had suddenly disappeared. I stood up, blind and disoriented. The fall had broken my habitual pattern, and I had no clue where to go. My sense of direction had completely abandoned me. I reached into my pocket, pulling out a book of matches. I hadn't needed it before, but I'm glad that I still had it. I drew one of the three matches and struck it. It sparked to life, temporarily blinding with a brilliant orange light. My eyes adjusted, and I realized that I was a mere two minutes away from my house. I sighed and began to approach my home when I spotted something out of the corner of my eye. There, crouching by the side of the road, was a dark shape. I froze. I had never felt fear like that before. I hadn't even been that scared when I met a monster in an abandoned public bathroom. There is no fear like the fear of the unknown. And that is exactly what I felt as I watched the shadow slowly approach. It drew closer, making my blood colder with each shuffling step. It raised its head, revealing two steely blue orbs that stared from its shadowed features. The eyes were like the Arctic Sea, cold and unforgiving. I felt needles of ice pierce my flesh, as I drowned in their frigid depths. I felt the cold water fill my lungs and burn my insides as I struggled hopelessly against the numbing current. My vision began to fade as the thing drew me closer and closer. It was less than a meter away. I felt a stab of hot pain from my finger, and my light went out. The next thing I knew, I was running towards the welcoming glow of my porch light, my lungs burning, my limbs feeling like they were filled with lead. I heard a shrill cackle from directly behind me. 
I picked up speed, barreling through the door and locking it behind me. I passed out on the floor in the entryway. The first thing I felt when I regained consciousness was the pain. My limbs felt as if they'd been pumped full of white hot iron. I opened my eyes, and blinding white light greeted my weary nerves. It took me a while to gain the willpower to get up off the ground and stumble to my bed, where I once again met with the blissful dark of unconsciousness. I woke up this afternoon with a new view on the events I've described. I figured that they were but a stress-induced hallucination. After all, I am recently divorced. I got up, stretched, and made my way downstairs for some breakfast. I was pouring myself some cereal when I realized that I would have to get milk from the downstairs fridge. I keep meat and dairy in a fridge in the basement. <laughs> my mother did it when I was young, and I guess old habits die hard. A familiar smell greeted me as I descended the creaking staircase. I froze, seeing that one of my windows had been neatly removed from its frame. A dull chuckle sounded from the corner of the dark room. I bolted up the stairs, locked and barred the door. I'm sitting at my computer, typing this. The thing in the basement is talking to me. It speaks in my neighbor's voice. It says it just wants to talk, to ask some questions. It's even asked me for the Wi-Fi password, <laughs> but I ignore it. I've locked all of my doors and windows. I'm terrified. I don't want to leave the house for fear of being attacked. There is no dial tone on the phone. I think it's cut the lines. Help me. What should I do?